decades into what is appropriately called the climate crisis, humans are now facing down a planet that has been profoundly changed by our collective activities. In a struggle to respond and hopefully save our future, the relationship between humans and nature is being reconstructed. And speaking of climate and weather, how appropriate was daylight saving time this weekend? Good evening and welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Our program tonight features Elizabeth Colbert, staff writer at The New Yorker and Pulitzer Prize winning author. She is joined in conversation with veteran journalist and host of CEO on KERA, Lee Cullum. I'm looking forward to this enlightening discussion on climate policy and Elizabeth's new book, under a white sky, the nature of the future. Please remember to purchase a signed book plate copy of Under a White Sky, the nature of the future at Interabang Books, our local bookstore partner. Our audience receives a 10% discount from Interabang Books in the online store using the code DFW World. And remember, it's not good just for Elizabeth's book, but for any books in your cart. We have a full schedule of virtual programs, so remember to check out our website at dfwworld.org for newly scheduled events. The Council is incredibly grateful for all of its supporters. Support for tonight's program is generously provided by the Patricia M. Patterson Lecture Endowment. I would like to remind everyone at this time that you too can sponsor a program. And in order to do so, you can get in touch with Alana Buenrostro at 956-466-1149 about sponsorship opportunities. Moderating today's conversation is prominent television, radio, and print journalist Lee Cullum. She currently hosts CEO on KERA and regularly contributes columns to the Dallas Morning News. Lee is a senior fellow of the Tower Center at SMU and a fellow at the Dallas Institute for Humanities and Culture. On the board of the Council on Forest Re Foreign Relations for 10 years, Lee is now involved in many policy organizations and institutions. And with that, Lee, take it away. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us, and we are excited. Thank you, Liz, and, and welcome to Dallas. We're thrilled to have you here, even though you did arrive on February 1st. We're so glad you didn't turn around and, and go back. Uh, you have to stay now. Elizabeth, congratulations on your terrific review yesterday in the New York Times. Uh, very, very, uh, very well-deserved. Uh, a little bit about Elizabeth before we start. She is well, yesterday, the New York Times called her one of the finest science writers anywhere, and I think that's absolutely true. Uh, her last book, The Extinction, The Sixth Extinction, won the Pulitzer Prize. It's, it's incredible work. Uh, she also writes regularly for The New Yorker and has for the past 20 years. It is very versatile. In the past five months alone, she has written about the Cuban Missile Crisis that confronted John F. Kennedy in October. That was late October, 1962. She's written about extraterrestrials. I think she's a little skeptical, but maybe I'm putting words in her mouth. She can correct me when she has a chance. Uh, she has her, and in the current issue, which is came out, at least I arrived, it arrived in my mail over the weekend, is an incredible uh, coverage, uh, is incredible coverage of a book called Owned, called Mine. I think she has another book she mentions there called Owned. It's about property rights. And they're not what you think they are. Uh, you thought you own the air rights above your property? Not necessarily. You thought the own, you own the rights to the books you buy? Not if they're on Kindle. Your own body parts are open to question. And so is your life as it is revealed through the data you accumulate. So I have to tell you, Elizabeth, that I read that article and I yanked up uh, Alexa and I put her in the garage, unplugged it, I banished her. I thought I think she's certainly spying on me and I haven't liked her anyway. That's uh, what's but, there, yeah. <laughs> so you can see, uh, and we all pay attention to, to your work. Uh, first of all, we, you, we were going to talk to you on February 16th. Uh, which is right after the St. Valentine's Day massacre that really came to the fore the day before. Uh, we're so pl pleased you're here now, but 
surely this, this storm can indeed be attributed in part to climate change. Well, I, I don't, you know, attribution in case in extreme weather events is, 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 a, is genuinely a science and I'm, you know, not one of the scientists who practice it has that, but I think that people are probably actively looking right now at the question of whether that is, has a climate change um, component, but I don't think that we have a clear answer. So I'm going to, I'm going to remain open-minded on that one. How's that? Well, that's why you're considered such a fine science writer. But to turn to Under a White Sky, the nature of the future, it brings to mind an old song, Blue Skies, all of them gone, nothing but white skies from now on. And I like to start at the back of your book and move to the front because I find the geoengineering that you write about extraordinary. I mean, it involves shooting particles into the stratosphere to block the sun. And But you know a lot more about this than I do. Tell us about the diamond dust and the uh, sulfates that we can expect to see in the sky hiding the sun. Well, I think this is a, a, a really, you know, good topic for a group that's interested in world affairs because it's a n n no, no, greater geopolitical challenge exists, I think, than you know, how we're going to grapple with climate change at this point. And the idea that you're referring to solar geoengineering, um, the issue here is that, you know, we've all poured a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. I'm sure your, our listeners don't need our whole, my whole global warming um, explanation, but the problem with climate change or one of the very big challenges of dealing with climate change is that once you've put that CO2 up there, it, it lasts, for, it stays up there for all intents and purposes forever. It's not like a lot of other air pollutants, you stop putting them up there and they will eventually dissipate or quickly dissipate. Uh, for example, you know, smog, which we dealt with by putting catalytic converters on everyone's cars. So that CO2 that we have put up there, that we continue to put up there every day, is going to stay around for a long time. It's going to warm the planet for a long time. And if you get to a point where you say, okay, this climate, you know, we really don't like, it's a humanitarian disaster or an ecological disaster, there is very little you can do on a human lifetime time scale. And the one proposal that's sort of on the table right now, and it's just, a, at this point, it's mainly a theory, I should say. I think most scientists believe it is practical, but it has not actually been tested. Um, and that is what's called solar geoengineering, which you, which you alluded to. And here the idea is we would basically mimic a volcanic eruption, a major volcanic eruption, put something, some substance, we can talk about what, into the stratosphere. Volcanoes put up sulfur dioxide. That forms these little droplets in the stratosphere that are very reflective. They reflect a lot of sunlight back to space and they cool the planet. They produce a temporary cooling effect. And the idea is, as we see in, in this diagram, the idea is that you would do that, you would keep doing it because it's just temporary when volcanoes doing, but we would keep doing it. And we would counter, potentially be able to counteract uh, global warming, counteract the effect of all that CO2 uh, with this, you know, either, either sulfate aerosols, what you're seeing in this diagram or some other reflective substance. So that is the idea behind solar geoengineering. Well, of course, I think there was, uh, there is to be a balloon launched from Lapland that will carry a gondola that will see if it can carry the equipment to, to, to shoot these particles uh, into the stratosphere. Uh, it was to have been approved on February 15th, the day before we were to, to speak. Was it approved? Um, I think that there is no approval yet from the Swedish government. Um, well, no, actually, I think what we're waiting for is something different. We're waiting. Anyway, we're waiting for various uh, groups to, to give their um, go ahead for this. But as you say, that is a, an experiment that would be done by the group that I talked to in the book, the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program, um, a bunch of really top flight scientists at Harvard. And they, as you say, they just want, they need to go somewhere without trees, sort of a treeless part of the world. Um, and they were thinking of the American Southwest, but now they are thinking of Lapland, as you say, and whether that experiment will go forward. I think that is a very interesting question. A lot of people are going to be looking at it because a lot of people look at even this first step, 
very preliminary step towards you know researching this technology as you know the proverbial camel's nose under the tent so there's a lot of opposition to even allowing that balloon to fly well a lot of opposition in sweden greenpeace sweden uh various environmental groups in sweden and some of the opposition says, and of course I'm quoting your book, that all this CO2 is already in the atmosphere and it's there forever, just as you said. And chances are there will be more, that if indeed we can block the sun, uh, probably the use of fossil fuels will continue. And so there'll be more and more, which means we have to have more and more particles. And uh, th that can be eventually a losing game. Is, isn't that what the concern is? Well, the, the concern, I think, yes, basically the fundamental concern, I mean, there are so many concerns we could, you know, spend all evening talking about that. Oh, I know. But the concern on a sort of practical political level is if you dangle this idea in front of people, well, don't worry about putting CO2 up in the air, we'll just, you know, counteract that with sulfur dioxide or whatever, that people will just keep putting, you know, not take their foot off of this accelerator that, you know, we will not do what we need to do to really bring CO2 emissions down. And if that is the case and you keep just pouring CO2 into the atmosphere, and then you have to keep pouring more and more particles into the stratosphere. So you can see this as a kind of weird, you know, variation on an arms race. And what you would get at the end of all that is potentially, you know, very, very dangerous. Yeah, because if you withdrew it, then, then all of a sudden you have a an unknowable and unpredictable and perhaps frightening situation. Yes, and also, you know, even before that, so there's what, as you, what you're alluding to, Lee, is this idea of termination shock. If you started this, you'd have to continue it because if you stopped, you know, then all that warming that had been masked basically would suddenly manifest itself. But, you know, the other problem, and these are very serious problems, and people are looking at them with computer models, but, you know, unfortunately you don't, know until you actually do it how accurate the models are is that you know you're not getting a climate that you would recognize you know you might be heating it in one way and cooling it in another way and you might really change regional weather patterns and the monsoon patterns and so this is where the or i shouldn't say this but in this is one of the ways that the geopolitics become really almost unthinkable because there you know will probably be winners and losers from this just as there are winners and losers from climate change and how do you get the world which can't agree on how to cut its co2 emissions to agree on how to manage geoengineering it's people are looking at it even as we speak because it is sort of one of those looming questions but it's hard to see your way through that one yeah, and of course you make the point that actually uh, one or two nations could just, could just go ahead and do it, which would cause uh, a lot of difficulty. But I want to move on to Ruth Gates. To me, she's the most interesting of the people you write about. And you write about many, maybe it's because I think you became friends. And, and I felt really grieved when she suddenly took ill and died, I'm sure, much too young. But she was running an interesting marine biology program in Hawaii, uh, trying to save the barrier reef in Australia, the, the, the coral were were disappearing because the oceans were heating up and uh, and she had she had plans to produce hybrid coral. How, how was that going to work? It was called assisted evolution. Very interesting. Yeah, so that that's really the story that sort of got me started on this whole book project. I went to visit um, Ruth in, uh, I guess it was 2016. And um, she was running a marine biological station in Hawaii. And the idea that she had come up with was, or, or the, the problem that she was trying to address was this problem that cor corals, which are these tiny little gelatinous animals that build these amazing structures that are reefs, um, they don't like it when water temperatures rise above a certain threshold. And what happens, as we're seeing in this photo, is that they, they turn white. And that is a sign, basically, we can sort of go through the biology, or, but I'll just give you the shorthand version, basically that they've uh, kicked out these little plants that live inside their cells and provide a lot of their nutrition. And once they kick out those little plants, they basically starve to death. So if this event lasts for a long time, 
you get a lot of dead coral. And on the Great Barrier Reef, something like half the coral uh, has perished in the last 30 years. So that's an astonishing figure and very serious. So Ruth's idea, and along she was, she was partnering with an Australian scientist by the name of Madeline Van Oppen, was, well, you know, you're not getting that heat out of the oceans in any human time frame, and it's just going to get worse as more CO2 goes into the atmosphere. So if we want reefs to survive this century, which, you know, surely we do, uh, we're going to have to start manipulating these animals, either by hybridizing them, as you mentioned, or, you know, some people are talking, even they, they had not quite gotten there yet, but if, could you identify a gene for heat tolerance? Could you try to gene edit corals? Um, people are talking about, could you try to brighten the clouds over coral reefs to provide some cooling? That's sort of like mini geoengineering. So all of these ideas are being floated to try to keep some remnants of these enormous reefs going uh, until that point, you know, that point in some future when we really do bring CO2 emissions way down and hopefully uh, you get, you know, a stable climate again. Um, sadly, as you alluded to, Ruth died about two years into this project, but the project does continue. And just about a year and a half ago, I went to see some of these, you know, crossbreeding experiments that they were doing where they bring in corals from different parts of the reefs breed them together in the hopes that some of their offspring will be particularly heat tolerant. Well, she had a firm view that uh, we couldn't go back. Uh, we simply have to do exactly what you're writing about. We just control the control of nature. And uh, one of your interviewers uh, said that there's been a tension, which we know if we think about it, uh, in the environmental movement between those who say only technology can save us now and those who say only a return to nature can save us now. But she's really saying, and so are you, you can't go home again because home isn't there. I mean, you were almost shocking when you said we've seen the end of nature. Uh, it's kind of like the end of history, Francis Fukuyama wrote about when the Iron Curtain came down. A few years later, a guy named John Horgan wrote about the end of science. He meant physics, everything had been discovered. They were wrong, but I have a feeling you're right. Well, I mean, that's sort of one of the themes of, of the book, you know, is this question of how, 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 how we've been, as soon as we invented the concept of nature in a way that was a sign that, you know, we were already separating ourselves as humans from this natural world, which, you know, has, doesn't have the capacity to name itself. Um, there are lots and lots of, you know, historians and environmental historians looking at this question of when did people really start to leave a mark uh, on the planet and I think it's a really interesting question and it may date way, way back to, you know, when people started to move around the world, early modern humans started to move around the world and we see um, these extinction of all the large, very large animals that used to populate the planet whenever people arrived in Australia and now, and then in North America and South America, we see these waves of extinction. So people have been, you know, altering nature uh, for a long time since the industrial revolution and certainly since the end of the second world war we have the change has been so immense uh you know quantitatively that many people would say it constitutes a qualitative change on in our relationship to nature it's just overwhelmed uh you know what are sometimes called the great forces of nature so just to name one example you know, we now put out more CO2, humanity, in our factories, in our cars, in our, you know, power plants, a uh, hundred times more CO2 than volcanoes do every year. And prior to that, prior to our starting to burn fossil fuels, volcanoes were the major source of CO2, you know, input into the atmosphere. So that is just one of the many ways we are now overwhelming uh, these geological, not just, you know, sort of natural, but geological forces. Well, you write about another 
creature, shall we say, in Australia, perfectly ghastly looking animal called a cane toad. It, it was in the New Yorker as well. I first read it there. Uh, they're unspeakably ugly. They spout poison at anybody or anything that gets nearby. And what are the Australians doing to try to get rid of them? They're, they're taking action, I gather. Well, they'll do anything to get rid of them. So these toads were um, imported into Australia in the 1930s in, from South America and Central America. That's what they're where they're native. And, and actually, I should say, since I'm speaking to folks in Dallas, they're also native to the very southernmost tip of Texas, uh, where it's warm enough. And uh, they were imported, exported really around the world. And they reached Australia in the 1930s in the hope that they were going to eat the beetles that were plaguing the sugarcane crop. That's why they're called cane toads. Now, they probably did not nothing to the beetles, but they were extremely adaptable and they just multiplied like crazy. And they are still expanding their range now after 80 years, they are still, uh, yeah, there are some of our friends. Um, they can grow to be extraordinary size. They can grow to be the size of a dinner plate or the size of a small dog. And as, as you said, Lee, they're, they're highly toxic. They have behind uh, their shoulder blades, they have these two glands where they store this toxin. And if something attacks them, they uh, create this enzyme that makes this toxin incredibly poisonous. So anything that bites them uh, gets a dose of it and drops dead. So a lot of um, Australia's native wildlife, which has no evolved you know, wariness of these toads. It eats these toads and it drops and they drop dead. And so Australians hate the toads. They bash them with golf clubs. They stick them in the freezer. They purposely run them over. They go over them with their lawn mowers. I mean, it's just become kind of, it's almost like a national sport to be honest. But the project that I went to visit were some scientists who were gene editing cane toads to be less toxic. And they had successfully done that. They had gene edited a batch of toads whom I saw to be less toxic. And the question now, you know, going forward, and this is true of a lot of invasive species that are very damaging for different, all sorts of different reasons, is, you know, gene editing has become so much cheaper and more um, faster that all sorts of horizons open up for gene editing, you know, the, the natural world or what we'll call the natural world. And is that the route that we want to take? And that is a really interesting and open question right now, even as we speak. Well, it's CRISPR that they're using, isn't exactly. it? Yeah. Exactly, CRISPR has really revolutionized gene editing. Well, you are on the trail of all kinds of weird fish. Some of them are in Chicago. Uh, I'm talking about the Asian carp. They too were imported for a perfectly good reason. And, uh, and they're eating everything too and, and, and causing havoc. What's going on in Chicago? So the, the Asian carp, I, as I discussed in the book, they're sort of like the cane toad inside out or upside down because they're, they're, the reason that they're such destructive um, invaders is because nothing eats them. They don't have natural predators in, in the U.S. They were brought over from Asia. They have um, multiplied like crazy. They're up and down the Mississippi River system, uh, all the way sort of at the edge of the Great Lake system. Um, and people, uh, yes, and they have many interesting habits, one of which is they really outcompete the native fish. So that's a really big ecological problem, a, a sort of human problem is that they jump, as you see in this wonderful photo. They tend to fling themselves into the air when they're frightened, uh, which could be because you're water skiing or in a motorboat. And so people are constantly getting injured by Asian carp. And I, I myself got smacked with an Asian carp and it is quite painful. Um, so they are, those fish are on the move. They were introduced, as you say, for, for good reasons, actually, ironically, for ecological reasons, but they sort of, things went awry. And now they're moving uh, up into, you know, sort of pressing up against the Great Lakes. And now there are these tremendous efforts to keep them out of the Great Lakes. 
Well, it was Rachel Carson uh, who called I me mean, her, her book, Silent Spring, where she said that pesticides are very bad, insecticides are very bad, and they were. So use, uh, use nature, if we could go back to nature, uh, use natural species to devour other species that you don't want. So that's what, that's what they did. But now they are diverting the Chicago River, I gather. Uh, they're building electric barriers. They're, it's quite an effort. Yeah, so, so these are two interestingly intersecting stories, you know, they, they sort of meet in Chicago. So the other part of the story is that um, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, Chicago reversed the flow of the Chicago River. And anyone who's been to Chicago, you know, has been to the Chicago River, which I don't know, is we're coming up on St. Patrick's Day. Often they dye the Chicago River green on St. Patrick's Day. I'm not sure they're going to do that this year. Um, but it's the river that flows right through downtown Chicago. And when Chicago was founded, it flowed east into Lake Michigan, and it became the repository, you know, to put it politely, of all of the city's waste, of its, of its human waste and of its stockyard waste as the stockyard groups grew up. So it was really um, completely revolting. And it was also a tremendous public health hazard because it was flowing into the lake from which Chicago was drawing its drinking water. So there were these continual outbreaks of waterborne disease. So Chicago decided to do something and that something was to reverse the flow of the river. So they built this huge canal that made the river flow west, but the river had to flow into something and now it flows into the Mississippi Basin. Basically it flows into the, you know, towards the Illinois River and then into the Mississippi. And so these carp, which were released in Ar all the way down in Arkansas, have worked their way all the way up the Illinois River and through this canal could get into the Great Lakes now because that canal um, joined these two systems that previously had been distinct. Uh, yeah, and where you see that bubbly creek there on that map, it bubbles, that part of the river still bubbles because there's so much organic matter, so much, you know, yeah, I will call it organic matter from the stockyards that it's still bubbling away, you know, 50, 60, 70 years after all those places were closed. Incredible. Well, now there's some good fish that you write about, uh, the little pupfish. They're very small, about an inch, I gather. There were about 35 of them left on the planet and some, uh, the park, park Service in Nevada has expanded that to 195. How did they do it and why did they want to? Well, the, the story of the Devil's Hole Pupfish, which is definitely you know my favorite creature in the book because they're really beautiful little fish. As you say, they're about an inch long and they're this sort of iridescent blue and they have these big, oversized black eyes that they look up at you or you think they're looking up at you, it has that. And they live in the middle of the Mojave Desert, which is kind of extraordinary, and only in the middle of the Mojave Desert in this one pool that sits at the bottom of this canyon, a small canyon called Devil's Hole. And the conditions in this canyon are really sort of in really harsh. They're, the water temperature is a a constant, it's heated geothermally, it's a constant 93 degrees. So most fish wouldn't last, you know, five minutes in there, but the devil's whole pupfish have evolved uh, to live under these incredibly extreme conditions. And in the 60s, yes, there they are, they're beautiful, you can see. Um, in the 60s, people began pumping water out of the aquifer that fills Devil's Hole, the pool at Devil's Hole. And that caused the water level to drop and had really serious ramifications for the poor pupfish. And so uh, eventually it was decided that um, all sorts of interventions on behalf of the pupfish were tried, but eventually it was decided by the Fish and Wildlife Service that they needed to have a whole backup population. And that backup population lives in a fake canyon it's about a mile from the real canyon uh, that was engineered to be as close a facsimile of the real thing as possible down to the contours, you know, of this, of the sides of this tank, uh, which is made, designed to be, you know, a replica of the real, of the real canyon. 
and it's been quite successful. Now, you, I gather it's beetles that were attacking the pupfish. You mentioned beetles earlier. They were after something else. Uh, beetles were after the sugar cane. Yeah, beetles. Yes, exactly, were and that's that's why they brought the, the ugly toads. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but now, but how did they get rid of the beetles? They strain them through mesh. Is that it? And pick them out with tweezers. Yes, they they had this beetle. They were that they thought was um, attacking the larvae of of the pupfish so that they were having trouble reproducing. And, you know, these beetles, you think of a beetle as being pretty big, but these were tiny little beetles about the size of a, you know, sesame seed. And to get these out of the water, uh, such are the attention, the ministrations uh, of the people trying to revive the, your, you know, increase the pupfish population that they would, put out these buckets with strainers in them, capture these beetles and pick out every single one of these beetles. Um, it was sort of mind numbing work. Just even watching it was sort of mind numbing. I can well imagine. And uh, we've been talking about the Mississippi River, which of course flows finally to, to New Orleans and the tip of Louisiana, which is vanishing into the sea. What's going on? Well, that's um, a very, very, you know, relevant story to folks in Texas. Um, so, you know, the whole Mississippi Delta is a product, is, is formed by the Mississippi, the Mississippi carrying down these vast loads of sediment from the Great Plains. And every year, you know, presumably in spring, the Mississippi used to overflow its banks and it would spread the sediment across the landscape. And that's how this whole area that you're seeing this picture that is all built up from year after year of this flooding and dropping this sediment. And then in uh, 1718, and then people were living in this area, you know, Native Americans were living here, but presumably when the river flooded in the spring, they just, you know, moved, they left the area. Then the French arrived and form New Orleans and found New Orleans, which you see there as sort of right there, yes, south of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, and once you found a city somewhere, you know, you're not gonna just get up and move every time the Mississippi decides it wants to flood. So the French dug in, they um, started erecting levees right away. This, the city, which was really just a town at the beginning, obviously, you know, flooded continually. They built, kept building up the levees. They built them up more upriver, further and further. And this has been a 300 year project of trying to control the Mississippi. And on some level, it's been very successful. There's New Orleans, you know, one of the great American cities. And most of the time it stays dry. The problem is that without an influx of sediment, it's sinking. So that land compacts, that sort of marshy soil that New Orleans was built on and that that whole area consists of is compacting and sinking away. So if you, if you can sort of see where those barrier islands are down there in the south, there used to be marshland that went right up to those barrier islands, but the land is just now uh, retreated. It's, it's just underwater, basically, a lot of what used to be dry or semi-dry land. And New Orleans itself is one of the fastest sinking places on earth, sinking at an astonishing rate. So now you need, yeah, so you're seeing that, that, that land loss, which is becoming really reaching almost a crisis point. So what the state is now planning to do, and I, I, there was just a piece recently about the environmental impact statement, I think this project is going to go forward, is they're trying to create another huge uh, waterwork system that will actually allow for sort of, I guess what you, what you call controlled flooding to counteract the effects of flood control. And so south of New Orleans, they're gonna punch a hole in the levees, build this enormous structure. And in spring, when the river would normally, you know, would have overflowed its banks, carries a lot of sediment, they will let, this water through the gates of this new structure and into a bay, a sort of shallow bay, and a hope that that sediment will build new land, which will then offer some protection to New Orleans. 
But don't they also have a project that, that you write about of uh, dredge, a big drill at the bottom of the river is dredging up sand and clay, putting it in a 30 inch pipe and sending it to this project so that it will be deposited and will become sediment and, and therefore land on which to build. Is, is that going on too? Yes, they're constantly doing that. They have all sorts of little, little projects that take a lot of energy and a lot of money and a lot of effort <laughs> uh, to sort of build up little bits of land by, as you say, um, it, you know, extracting sediment from the bottom of the river and sort of spewing it in onto, you know, shallow marshy soil and, and building up land. The problem here is that soil compacts too, so those are very temporary projects and they just don't feel that those are on a scale sufficient to counteract all this land loss. So, you know, just to give you a sense of how much land southern Louisiana is losing every year, um, a football field's worth of land every 90 minutes gets lost from southern Louisiana. So that adds up pretty quickly. Incredible. You write that parts of New Orleans are, is it 15 feet below sea level? Am I making that up? <laughs> Whatever I wrote, Lee, I'm afraid I don't have that figure at the tip of my fingers, but it gets very low, ridiculous, seemingly ridiculously low. Yeah. Can anything be done about that? Well, you can't, you, you can't jack that land up. I mean, no, you, you can't, <laughs> no could, matter how you try. You could let it flood again. I mean, that was a proposal, you know, after Katrina, when the city was really devastated. And I visited New Orleans pretty soon after Katrina, and I'm sure some of our listeners did too perhaps, but it was, you know, just destroyed. Uh, there were proposals, well, we should basically not let people back into New Orleans. We should let the river reflood it and add more sediment into what's called the bowl. It's shaped like a bowl, you know, uh, into the bowl um, because otherwise, we're just getting this perpetual sinking. Now that was rejected for, you know, pretty obvious political reasons. But it's hard to see. The only thing that people can think of to, to do for New Orleans is, you know, build up these levees higher and higher, which has been done, and then try to offer some kind of buffering zone to the south, since you can't let the city flood, you know, can you sort of build up those wetlands again with projects like the one you're talking about with, you know, just pumping sediment onto the land or trying to use the energy of the river. That's really what this is about. These, these what are called sediment diversions, um, try to use the river's energy as opposed to having to use, you know, diesel fuel, which is very expensive. Well, you must have seen this story on the front page of the New York Times today about the, the outer areas of North Carolina that have the same problem, a beach that's eroding, uh, there, there are people who live there who want to keep the beach. It's, it's a tourist center. It, jobs depend on it, but it's very expensive to keep rebuilding the beach. Yeah, and as sea levels rise from climate change, and sea levels are rising from climate change for, for two reasons, one of which is, you know, simply that w as we heat up the oceans, warm water just takes up more volume. So we're just, you know, our, the oceans are just expanding. And then also, we're melting a lot of ice off of, you know, places like Greenland and Antarctica. So, you know, sea level rise is 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 in our future. There's just no doubt about that, uh, and quite likely accelerating sea level rise. And very low lying areas, of which you know Texas has many, um, are going to be facing these very difficult choices. Are we going to completely re-engineer ourselves, which is expensive and in some cases very difficult, uh, or are we gonna have this kind of have to retreat from some of these very low lying areas? And I think that you're gonna be reading those stories like the one you know on the front page of the Times uh, more and more because these issues are starting to sort of come to a head. And it's the same problem you cited in New Orleans. They can rebuild the, be the beach, but it'll have to be redone in five years. Yes, yes. It's a perpetual. And then you really have to, I mean, if you're going to undertake something like that, you really need to look at these projections and say, okay, how long could this possibly last? But people 
have a fairly short time horizon with their beach house, I suppose. So, I mean, you know, maybe you can get 10 or 20 years and maybe people will say that's worth it. You know, I don't know who's paying for it exactly, but it's a huge, huge issue all really in, on, in almost every coastal community in the States is gonna be a big issue. Well, in North Carolina, evidently, various governments are not stepping forward to pay. So these communities are talking about taxing themselves, which will be very difficult. Yes, I mean, I do think that's what made that story so interesting. Once again, is people are really going to have to take it on themselves, which one of these, uh, which is the lesser of two evils here, you know, and that's, uh, that's a, that's a very hard call. And I think, you know, while I did not write about this particular, you know, conundrum, that's really at the heart of the book. There's just increasingly just really hard choices, not easy choices. It's not, there's not, you know, you might say, well, let's just, let's just leave things alone. Well, for that town whose name I've forgotten, um, you know, that's not an option. Leaving them alone means, you know, we're not going to be here. Well, in Houston, Texas, it's not an option either. And, and they too are concerned naturally after the various hurricanes they've lived through. Let's go to some questions. Uh, this is from Don Crook. Uh, would putting sulfates into the stratosphere to block sunlight and cool the earth negatively impact agricultural production? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I think that, um, you know, one of the questions would be like how much, right? Obviously, um, you know, you would genuinely be reducing the amount of direct sunlight that hits the earth. Now, I've, I've seen papers, scientific papers that um, point out that sun, plants actually like indirect sunlight. So uh, that you sh shouldn't have a tremendous impact on agriculture, you know, if you didn't go, you know, didn't, if you did it in a very, in a measured way, how's that? But these are all big questions. I mean, you know, solar power generation, uh, and would you impact that? I mean, it, all, all of these are questions that people are going to, you know, if they decide to let this balloon flight go, and if we decide to go down the path of even researching this technology, all of these are questions that people are going to have to look at. Uh, I think that those are questions that we could, you know, probably answer pretty in a pretty robust way. And then there are those questions that we were talking about before of how you're going to actually change, you know, are you, are you going to change global weather patterns that are much harder to, you know, explore in a laboratory setting? I think David Keith is your colleague who runs the program at Harvard for geoengineering. He's raised quite a lot of money. Do I remember $20 million? Yeah, they have a they have about twenty million dollars to 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 research, and that includes you know the balloon flight that you were talking about. Where is the funding coming from? Do you have any idea? It's coming from a lot of um, private philanthropists. Bill Gates put up some money. Um, a, a bunch of you can look on their website. Uh, oh. They're they're very open about where their funding comes from, but it's mainly private individuals. Maybe a couple of foundations. Okay, now where is, let's go to another question. Uh, this is Raymond Termini. Are we so far down the path of global change and it is too late to turn back and must look to more radical, hard ge geoengineering techniques to cool the climate? Well, that, you've cut right to the, you know. That's, he's got your book. He, he got yeah, your at, the, at the heart of the book. And um, I don't have a an easy answer for that. I mean, we're definitely very, very deep into this. And the question of, you know, whether we're going to then sort of double down with more radical interventions or whether that's even more dangerous than just, you know, trying to deal with, trying to retreat, you know, to a certain extent. Um, those are really, really hard questions to answer. That is sort of the point of the book, I guess you could say, is to put those questions on the table. But I don't kind of claim to be a, you know, future, have a clear crystal ball to tell you which of these choices is, 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 is more dangerous. But there are those you quote who say, what's the alternative? Absolutely. And there are, you know, I do think it's important for us to be honest and say, 
you know, if we take the reefs, for example, that's a, it's a good example, you know, we're not getting the reefs of the past back. We're not getting the climate of the past back. Um, so then the question is, what is the best, what are the best measures to take knowing that? Are they some of these very grand interventions? Are they smaller interventions? Uh, are they, you know, retreating from coastal cities? I mean, these are all really, really big questions um, that there won't be a single decision, you know, one global decision, this is the future of the world, but they will be being made at every level of, of government, um, you know, from, from here on, because we're gonna keep facing them. And we have a question from Hillary. Do you think that paying for carbon offsets to compensate for air travel, as you write about in the book, will become a common phenomenon? Well, you know, what I'm writing about in the book is even more um, sort of, I don't want to say profound, but there are carbon offsets, which are very complicated to account for. Like, for example, you could say, well, I paid someone to put up solar panels and that offset my carbon emissions. And those are complicated and somewhat controversial. And what I was talking about in the book was actually sort of the next step, which is actually paying people to take carbon out of the air for you. Um, and in my, in the case of these, uh, of this carbon removal that I was paying for in Iceland, they were actually taking carbon out of the air and shoving it deep underground into this, into this volcanic rock where it was mineralizing. And, you know, carbon removal, carbon dioxide removal, I think, um, is going to be a part of our future, you know. Um, and do I, you know, recommend it? I right now it's extremely expensive. <laughs> um, so you know, I paid a lot of money to have one flight's worth of CO two removed. Um, you can buy offsets that are much much cheaper, uh, almost yeah, much much cheaper. But the question of how much good they're doing is a much more open question at that point. And this is Howard Townsend. How much carbon dioxide is being produced by permafrost melting as opposed to automobile exhaust? Well, I don't know that anyone knows the answer to that question. One of the real fears, um, you know, we know how much uh, CO2 is being put up by, by cars. You know, we can kind of estimate that and by our energy production, but the CO, actually what's coming off of the permafrost is, is methane, not CO2, but all very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and that is a very active um, subject of research right now and a real fear. So what happens in the permafrost is you get a lot of organic material that doesn't decompose fully because it's frozen. And if you heat it up, people may have seen those incredible photos of those holes that have opened up in Siberia. The, the theory is that, you know, you get a buildup of methane and they basically just explode and create these kind of craters, which are, I, are wild looking. You can go online and find a lot of photos of them, but you may start to get this breakdown of this organic material that will then produce methane that will then really add to our climate problem. And you know, the question of whether we're already doing that to a certain extent we are, but whether that's a serious contributor to climate change at this point or not, I think is unclear. Is methane a, a byproduct of fracking? Methane is, methane is what we're, methane is basically natural gas. Natural gas is, you know, basically methane. And one of the, um, questions about fracking and how much it's contributing to climate change is how much are we leaking? How much of it gets leaked from the well? And unfortunately, methane is an even more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So if you, so, you know, natural gas burns a lot cleaner than coal and it produces less CO2 per unit of energy than coal. But if we're leaking a lot of methane before we even get it to the power plant, then potentially using natural gas is no better than using coal. It depends, on, that calculation depends on this leak injury. 
Hillary has another question for you. What about carbon sequestration? Well, that that's really um, so you could you could burn any kind of fossil fuel and you could take the CO2 out of the waste stream and you could, once again, in theory, or not even in theory, it, it is being done in certain places and you could pump it underground and store it. Um, and you could do that. And that you know would be certainly better than just letting the CO2 go into the atmosphere. The, the, the problem with it is it takes a lot of energy just to do it. So it's like a third of your energy that you're producing. Let's say you're a coal-fired power plant or a natural gas power plant, and you're trying to capture and sequester your own emissions, something on the order of a quarter or a third of the energy you're producing is just going back into dealing with your own emissions. So I, by the time you're doing that, you know, there's a pretty compelling argument to be made, well, let's just not do that, let's just you know find other ways to produce electricity. And uh, Kirsten, whom you met earlier, who's helping us today, thank heaven, uh, says there are efforts in Iceland already to scrub carbon from the atmosphere. Is that something that could work on a global scale? Well, I, I went to visit one of these, you know, operations where they use this machine that looks like a a giant air conditioner to suck, literally, you know, suck CO2 out of the air. They, they blow, you know, air just wafts over this sort of chemical solution and the CO2 binds with these chemicals and then they shove the CO2 deep underground. That's what I was talking about before and it, it, it mineralizes. Um, now, could that be expanded on a global scale? Once again, for a lot of money, uh, yes, it could be, but then you do have two, you know, problems here too. One is that takes energy too. So that's just like, you know, scrubbing your CO2 emissions from your power plant. It, it, it takes energy and money to do that. Um, and then you also have the question of where are you going to put all that CO2? And in Iceland, they shove it underground into this volcanic rock, but, you know, where I am in New England, for example, that would not be viable. So you need to be in a place where you have something to do with the CO2, otherwise uh, it doesn't do you any good. And Hillary would like to know this, what are your thoughts on the politicization of the failure of the Texas power grid during our recent winter storm? Some blaming green e energy for the failure, others disagree. Lucky you, you get to uh, <laughs> adjudicate. Well, I, think it's, I think it's, I will say, I think it's very unfortunate that it has been politicized like this. It should be a, you know, opportunity for people to look at, you know, Texas's energy system and how you want to move forward and to turn it, in. as unfortunately everything in our country seems to be turned into, you know, yet another partisan opportunity for partisan um, dispute seems really unfortunate. I, I you know, I think that if it's used as an opportunity, and I, I, from what I've read, I don't think this is, you know, fair. I don't think this is what caused the problem. Um, but as a, as a reason to avoid, you know, wind power, which is a big, big source of power in Texas, um, I think would be, you know, super unfortunate. So it's kind of fiddling while California burns and Dallas freezes, something like that. One last question, and I know we're almost out of time. I went back and took another look at the sixth extinction. I had read it when you won the Pulitzer Prize. I took another look. Was struck by something you said that we assume that these changes from climate change and other phenomena occur very gradually, but it can be very abrupt, unexpected and abrupt. Yes, I mean, I think one of the big worries in all of these, you know, situations um, and climate change is, is probably exhibit A, is that you push the system. Um, one climate scientist once offered me the analogy of, of a rowboat, you know, you, you push it and it, and it g goes back, it, you push it and it goes back and you push it enough and it flips over and it reaches a new stable state, which is upside down. And that is the danger that these, that there are certain thresholds that you cross and you just get, you know, not just a gradual change anymore, but sort of a phase shift. 
and things change very dramatically and very fast. And there are, you know, unfortunately, examples in the in the fossil record that seem to suggest that the planet is capable of some pretty dramatic and violent changes, even ones that people can't retroactively explain. Um, and we're pushing these systems really hard. You know, uh, there's just no doubt about it. Well, Elizabeth, thank you very much. And back to Liz Brailsford. Well, that was uh, an excellent conversation about a critical topic. Time is up. And uh, I really appreciated that. Also loved the focus on wildlife. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone to buy a signed book plate copy of Elizabeth's book, Under a White Sky at Interabang Books and use code DFWWORLD. All of our audience gets a 10% off discount with that code. And to catch up on our past programs, head on over to our YouTube channel at DFW World. And if you're not a member of our council, please join us. We'd love to have you. I'd love to meet you in person when we uh, move forward with that in due time. So visit dfwworld.org for more information on membership. And otherwise, ladies, I just really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your time. And to all of the audience, thank you for joining us and have a good evening. Thanks. <laughs>